Dr. Robert Smith, chiropractic internist. Today I want to talk to you about viruses, their connection to mitochondria, and how that inflammation interaction applies to just about every viral infection that we have, and specifically how our body has developed defense mechanisms through evolutionary processes that allow us to defend ourselves against viruses, and specifically how this learning of this information has come about over the last 35 years. It explains why some people are more susceptible to viral infections than other individuals, and also what separates those people that can be copied and replicated in individuals who maybe don't have the same genetic pattern, but if given the right nutrients, they have a better chance of being able to mount an appropriate immune response to defend themselves against viral infections. So today we're going to go through that information and make it relevant as to not just COVID-19, but all viral infections, so we can figure out how to do a better job of making our immune system work appropriately when we're exposed to viruses. Acute viral infections, as an example, have certain impacts we now know about how they go about when they implant inside of a cell to hijack the operations of a cell. Just understand that we now also appreciate the fact that if we've got excess amounts of sugar, that makes the system a little bit more vulnerable. This is why diabetic patients tend to have a harder time dealing with viral infections and that's due to the fact they have so much sugar that's infused in the tissue already. From Dr. Vasquez's book, Antiviral Nutrition, it's important to understand when he makes the point that when we talk about total viral load, what we're looking at is actually three different groups of viruses that we typically don't really think about because most of the time we think in terms of the exogenous viruses, the viruses that come to us from the outside. So this is going to be your examples of the uh, Epstein-Barr virus, the Cytomegalia virus, uh, the Parvo-19 virus, the human papillomas virus, viral infections like the mumps, the measles, chickenpox that we get from the outside that's one group of viruses we're dealing with. And they're individual because not everyone has had the exact same exposure rate to viruses. Then there's the other group, the endogenous viruses. Those are ones that most of us don't really think about, but those are the bits and pieces of virus that have been trapped into the DNA of our mother and father. And when they produce us as a viral uh, ovum and then you have implantation and you develop as a child, you now have picked up those endogenous viruses from your parents. Those viruses themselves do have an impact on things and we'll go over that in just a few seconds. But then we also have the bacteriophages. Those are the phages that reside in the two and a half to three pounds of bacterial organisms that exist in our intestines typical count is about 1,200 phages found in that colony and those vary up and down. When those viruses become more uh, plentiful, oftentimes they're associated with more immune system problems. And it's important just to get a concept that these different virus populations exist because as I'll show you here, we now know that these exogenous viruses as well as endogenous viruses can play a part in our ability to develop many different cancers. So it's important to realize that as science is progressing, we're realizing that these viral infections running in the background can still be producing low level inflammation. And that we now understand that we have things called pattern recognition receptors that are called toll-like receptors. Currently, I believe there's been identified 13 of them. And of these toll-like receptors, 11 or pretty well thought of to be existing in humans, and of those, we know that some of them specifically will react to viral infections. When we look at the example here, and this is talking about, from Dr. Vasquez, talking about how scleroderma is actually tied in to the background running of the cytomegalia virus, the Epstein-Barr virus, that Parvo-19, even H. pyloric can play a big part in synergistically upregulating the immune system in such a way that you sort of have a crossover things like molecular mimicry. You increase that cytokine amplification. Most of us have heard about with the COVID-19, a cytokine storm, 
There's also cytokin low-level twisters, if you will, or dust devils that are going on in relationship to just eating will produce certain cytokin upticks. It's important to understand that all of this ties in together and that's happening all the time. When you have more things going in the background, say like intestinal overgrowth as it relates to the gases that are produced by bacteria. In the case of methane, it's usually associated with constipation. Hydrogen sulfide is usually associated with diarrhea. These changes in intestinal mobility, hypermobility, are related to the effects of these gases and other metabolites from bacteria on the mitochondria. So they actually dampen or upregulate the production of the ability to get muscle contractions in your intestines. All of this goes back to the fact that it shows the alteration of your immune system function. When you look at how viruses interact in the presence of other viruses, this is how you understand the concept of androgenic drift. What that means is this is an example of, say, the parvo virus that was found in dogs in the early uh, 1980s, the late 1970s, and what happened was apparently a dog became infected that also had a cold. And that combination of those two viruses in one host led to the drift, if you will, of a new species being created. So now you had Parvo-19. Well, Parvo-19 had a new characteristic. It could infect humans. So that uh, disease process became known as Fifth's disease. This is the one where you look at children and they got like real, real red cheeks like they've been slapped, and that's an example of another born virus problem that developed literally out of the parvo virus that was killing many dogs, and then you had the parvo-19, which affects and infected children. The problem is some adults can be affected by parvo-19, and it can cause pretty significant health consequences. And understand that we need to appreciate that viruses pretty well work the same. No matter what type of virus we're talking about when it relates to humans, they'll infect, they'll make an envelope, they're going to hijack their DNA or RNA processes depending if they're an RNA or DNA type virus. In the case of this COVID-19, it's an RNA virus. In the case of other viruses, they may DNA. But the point being is the mechanisms are very similar. And if you look at it, they all go through cellular attachment, nucleic entry, DNA or RNA machinery is going to be hijacked and this translation process, they're going to make proteins, they're going to assemble themselves, and if you look at it, this applies to even the HIV virus, the influenza virus, the polio virus, adenovirus, any of the other viruses we talk about, which we're going to talk about several here in a little bit, but they all have similar mechanisms. What's important to realize the ultimate design of the virus, they're trying to make more of themselves and release into other parts of tissue. And in this, we're going to find there's many mechanisms, such as things that our body has already developed. There are antiviral uh, drugs out there. There's antiviral nutritional components out there that will change the operational machinery and block the virus's ability to replicate. The anti-replication process is a different mechanism where because we have these specific nutrients in our body, it blocks their ability or inhibits their ability to make themselves, whereas general nutrition and actually cell support the same point of how healthy is your mitochondria, how healthy are the rest of the cells in your body. All of this comes out in more detail if you look at Dr. Vasquez's text on antiviral strategies and immune nutrition. But this is just a quick overview that I wanted to give you something you can do. Understand that we now realize that mitochondria have all sorts of different things that alter their effectiveness at being able to make ATP. Every cell we said now has 200 to 2,000 mitochondria. So basically all cells are, we're collectively a housing project for mitochondria. But it's important to realize that this mitochondria has DNA. And this particular DNA comes from its, our mother. So the evolutionary process has this mom's DNA from mitochondria, which is going to be looked at as basically having an impact on a lot of things. But one of the big things in the background is intercellularly, what we're talking about, this is all about calcium. So the primary secondary messenger system of every cell, once you get inside of it, is calcium. 
Most of it's being brought in through a type of receptor called the n methyl aspartate receptor. If any of you have seen that movie, Rain on Fire, that particular girl suffered from antibodies attacking that particular receptor. It's been found that this particular receptor can have antibodies made to it and not necessarily the full-blown symptom that she had, but it's important to understand that this particular receptor is significant as a big driver for calcium influx into a cell. It also is going to have to do with that balanced act of the oscillation of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where protein is made, so think of that as the origami shop, if you will, and the energy shop, the mitochondria, which is going to be taking that calcium and changing up or down the amount of ATP being made. Also on the cell lining, there is something called peroxisomes. We now know that these peroxisomes have different characteristics and they also work as a proximal peripherator activator receptor which is basically nothing more than a fatty acid receptor, if you will. So this explains why the omega-3 acid, EPA, has an effect on down-regulating inflammation, or why the gamma linoleic acid has an effect on down-regulating inflammation. So if your cell wall is made with good, healthy fats, such as those, this has the effect of making the cell not as prone to inflammation. If you've made your cell out of things like lipids like soybean oil, corn oil, that alters these receptors and makes them more susceptible. So margarine, those sort of things, have a dilatorious effect on the cellular level in the fact that they change the proximal activator receptor sensitivity. In the case of calcium in the abnormal standpoint, viruses are in the process they will hijack the calcium signaling and in part direct what the endoplasmic will be doing, reticulum will do, and the mitochondria. So they'll take the energy, they'll direct the making of certain new protein structures to replicate a virus. And then it's another point that we have to appreciate. Of those case of viruses being affected out there that have got RNA or DNA, in our case in the mitochondria, we're dealing with DNA. In the lung tissue, you're dealing with a population of 1,100, 1500 mitochondria per cell because it's a high metabolic process going on. It takes lots of energy. The problem is when the infection of a cell in the lung tissue takes part of its activity and say it tries to make 80 viral phages, what it's doing is when it gets ready to go, it's going to rupture and release the DNA from mitochondria. That's going to be associated with a damage associated molecular pattern and that DNA of mitochondria is now liberated. The problem comes in that bacteria are the evolutionary track that have given us the mitochondria. So the bacterial DNA we have evolved a defense mechanism for that basically is called a pathogen associated molecular pattern recognition so that when we encounter bacterial DNA it's going to be impacted on a cell, specifically the neutrophil, a white blood cell type, on this toll-like receptor number nine. The toll-like receptor has the impact of initiating the neurotrophic chemotaxis process in this particular type of white blood cell. What's important to realize is that upregulating of that, this is where you're going to get white blood cells moving towards bacterial infections. Our problem comes on with the 1200 to 1500 mitochondrial DNA that is inside that lung cell that just ruptured is going to be misidentified by our immune system as a bacterial DNA because of its origin. So the toll-like receptor number nine inside these neutrophils is going to cause a extremely aggressive response to what appears to be a massive DNA invasion of bacteria. This is what's going to initiate the acute lung injury of where your body is sending in all of these different white blood cells to coalesce, solidify, and actually thicken up as a mucosal area to wall off this bacteria that's been identified. The problem is this assault against this case is being driven by a virus and a mistaken cross mimicry effect of mitochondrial DNA. The end result is this process of these large overwhelming responses is what we associate with pneumonia. 
understand that this reactive oxygen stress is being produced out of this entire inflammatory process of the mitochondrial DNA is initiating all kinds of chemical processes to deal with this and help to drive the inflammation cycle. And if you already have inside the cell an additional amount of inflammation, say from higher sugar levels or smoking or things such as this, this is, or even in the case of someone with kidney problems, uric acid levels being high. All of these preload the cell to make it even more profound of an inflammatory reaction. And it's crossover reaction by that toll-like receptor number nine. It's important to also understand that that toll-like receptor number nine is going to be initiating that reaction in the presence of DNA from a virus, DNA from a gram-negative bacteria, DNA from a gram-positive bacteria, the fungi, as well as protozoas. All of these have DNA. In the case of this particular virus, it's not the RNA of that virus that's initiating this particular response to toll like receptor number 9. It's to toll like receptor number 3 or 7 or 8. But the point to remember is when that virus replication hits terminal completion inside the cell and initiates the rupture, the mitochondria that we've been talking about is now going to be mistaken as a total like receptor number nine. So this explains why all of these different structures can be associated with causing pneumonia, but in the case of an aggressive virus that has a very jagged edge that can initiate the lysis or ripping open of the cell quicker, is why this is going to be a quicker replicating process and become overwhelming because the crossover, the damage associated with molecular pattern of the mitochondria being mistaken for that pathogen associated molecular pattern receptor. And then we have to take into consideration other individual vulnerabilities that the person may be suffering from when they become infected. We know that being exposed to a lot of lead, manganese, cadmium, arsenic, mercury and aluminum increase the susceptibility of the mitochondria to being made more likely to have a problem because it's not making good ATP already. So what happens, that same n methyl receptor we talked about before, that's the big gateway for calcium going in, will also act as a gateway for lead, manganese, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, or aluminum. In the case of these, we know that that's associated with batteries, cigarette smoke, we know this was lead paint, we know this was gasoline, we know that arsenic was used for years as a method for us protecting the cotton crops in the south against bow weevils. And inadvertently we found out later on that arsenic has the ability to be picked up by rice. That rice, once it's produced in the germ layer of the rice, so brown rice, the germ layer, still on it, not the white rice, has got a fairly good dose of a little bit of arsenic. So then we have to take consideration, okay, we eat brown rice is maybe not that good for us if we got arsenic and then it's also made worse say if we look at say we're eating some of the healthier products or we thought to be healthier products where it says used with sweetened with brown rice syrup we now realize oh that actually can have a fairly decent dose of arsenic that exceeds recommended uh, recommended doses and also there's been certain statements made that we need to consider how much white rice we consider taking in as well as what we do with children giving them rice cereal may not be a real good plan in the case of mercury where do we get mercury from high fructose corn syrup if you look that up you'll find that it's got a fairly decent exposure rate of mercury associated with it and this of itself can be a problem aluminum most of us think about aluminum foil or something like that actually it's not the case most of the aluminum you get is associated with double action baking powder which most of the commercially produced breads in this country use as a way to initiate a leavening process by having the aluminum all of these could be a problem because that extra metals will go into your uh, mitochondria through what they call uniports uniport one uniport two and the essential mitochondrial regulator doesn't seem to take it in that way but it does make a difference how quickly this gets inside of a cell and that will disrupt the effectiveness of your electron drain transport in the case of when we start looking at this 
not just involving lung tissue and we start realizing that same scenario where mitochondria are being mistaken as bacteria and initiating a response from the white blood cell called a neutrophil you begin to understand that this becomes basically an acquired mitochondrial dysfunction of a massive component where it becomes multiple organ dysfunction this is in the case in a virus that can replicate quickly due to the nature of its particular shape it causes cell breakdown rapidly and it spreads throughout different tissues this is where these damage associated molecular patterns of mitochondria and other tissue parts start working on pattern recognition receptors and this cascade of all this inflammatory process being driven by the white blood cells responding to these different components will begin to be a problem not only to the endothelial lining of arteries but the whole coronary system becomes affected. This can be associated with something called disseminating intervascular coagulation. This is where you have a problem of basically the blood turning into a clot all throughout the body. In the case of the microcirculation breakdown where the endothelial lining of capillaries are being broken down such an example of viruses like hemorrhagic fever or uh, dengue fever or in the case of some of the other more uh, outlandish viruses that have been out there that make a overwhelming damage across microcirculation these are the ones that patient, patients start having bleeding out of their eyes and basically out of all sorts of simple mucous membranes because of the overwhelming effect of bacteria in the case of COVID and other bacterial uh, other viral infections similar to it this is the respiratory system being overwhelmed in the case of the intestines it's fulminating uh, diarrhea kidney problems because those capillary beds around the glomerular tuft being damaged by that same process of mistaken uh, mitochondria as a bacteria that's actually being driven by a viral infection the liver can be overwhelmed in the case of the brain we think of encephalitis occurring all of these become multi-organ dysfunctions and this is what's being experienced by some patients in critical care units with this particular virus because they have so many other comorbidities that make this process rapidly happen and cause these fulminating problems. We know quite a bit about what healthy mitochondria look like. We know that this pink one is a big player in either upregulating or downregulating inflammation inside of a mitochondria. We know that there are things that happen in the events of nutritional deficits, these toxins we talked about, not just heavy metals, some persistent organic pollutants can have problems of doing the same thing. And the examples here are this depletion of this entire nutritional supplementation that normally would keep this in check overwhelms the system. And this is going to talk about some of the reasons of what we can do to help mitigate some of the overwhelming processes in mitochondria. This slide is a very great slide because it explains that mitochondrial dysfunction happens with those low-level cytokine storms we talked about, not just full-blown uh, big ones that we think about. Because the low-level ones, the background inflammation of viral infections, play a big part and some of the more common things that we see commonly in people on an ongoing basis we think of being just uh, an inflammatory driven process but we didn't have a good mechanism to explain we do now we understand that that mitochondrial process running in the background that's being dysfunctional is going to make more free radicals it depletes the oxidative antioxidant depletion and with that this malfunction becomes more component driven in the background this is also something that's going to have an impact on something that directs cellular inflammation, the clinic factor kappa B, which then also in the case of viruses enhances that low-level viral replication going on, such as the viruses we'll talk about in a little bit. But these also allow for viral mutations. This example right over here sort of explains the microcosm of a cytokine storm whether it be in the case of like a very effective virus at making the storm such as COVID-19 or say in the case of Epstein-Barr virus when you don't have the right nutrients to keep it completely in check so it sort of runs in the background if you will like a virus on a computer low level continual overplay in the system that does things is going to have a damaging effect because in the case of the low level background things this is where we're talking about 
viruses now that are associated with making problems like these. We know that there are things that we can do that help mitochondrial survivability. We know there are things we can do that will help them become more effective and not be overwhelmed. So this is what we're going to direct our attention at. The antiviral components that Dr. Vasquez has pointed out are we know that these different components of minerals, specifically here zinc and selenium, seem to be associated with a Fenton type reaction that is an evolutionary adaptive immune system component where these particular systems and the availability of zinc or the availability of selenium has been incorporated into this process that our body uses direct these two specific areas of attack by viruses and certain bacteria. Having adequate amounts of selenium and or zinc from an evolutionary standpoint makes these individuals better able to react to the viral infection or certain bacterial infections and in so doing they're able to slow it down without making it an overwhelming assault in the case of that toll-like receptor being affected and the overwhelming ability of your body thinking that it's been invaded by bacteria. Iodine plays a part in it and specifically we know that lysine plays a big part in the eight different herpes viruses with us. We know that anti-replication is important to understand something here. Methylation when we think about this there's simple blood tests that will tell you if you have adequate methylation uh, prevention from becoming overwhelmingly due to the ability to not suppress and have hypomethylation so you then have the problem of viruses being able to replicate better. The methylators as they are associated with making uh, the ability to stop having runaway DNA activation is important because when you have hypomethylation, these are the states that allow for viruses to replicate easily. These are the states that allow for cancers to begin to replicate easy. So you don't want yourself in a state of hypomethylation. Hypomethylation translates to high homocysteine levels. There are other factors that will make a difference, such as having a genetic SNP, say the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, that we associate as being one of those that's been identified in the 23andMe program. If you have the heterozygous or the homozygous state, it depends on how badly that malformation is going to affect you, but that would have an effect on raising homocysteine level. In that case, you may need to be supplementing with, say, a further developed form of that folic acid, maybe using 5-methylfolate as a supplement. The cases have happened with several other SNPs that have been identified, but the point being is you can identify them and knowing that you have an elevated homocysteine level. If that's the case, that means you have a problem with hypomethylation and what you would want to do is to make sure you don't have that problem. This becomes important because in the case of NF-kappa B, that's a different driving system that allows for replication of viruses and that's because we don't want to have elevated nucleic factor kappa B especially realize that NAC, N-acetylcysteine, besides having several things that it does beneficial in the case of antivirals, it allows for the support of the glutathione pathway inside the cell, which is important because mitochondria make reactive oxygen stress compounds. One of the things that helps with that is N-acetylcysteine. Also, N-acetylcysteine in the case of lung viral infections has the benefit or in fact uh, any type of infection in the lung where you have a large mucus development is a mucolytic compound so it helps to cut the amount of mucus and thins it so that it's actually more viscous and easily cough up. Again uh, alpha lipoic acid, selenium, zinc, all those have the ability to work in those particular metallic proteins that structure that house their compounds and they work as that through that Fenton reaction we talked about working specifically on being able to deactivate certain uh, viruses and certain bacteria. It's important to realize that we've known for some time that selenium is capable of doing antibacterial antiviral processes through the selenoproteins and it's important to also realize that we now realize that certain bacteria are also able to be blocked by this same process. The problem becomes that when we realize something else is even more significant and that's when we have 
other compounds out there such as these vaccines where we've come to the realization that these vaccines actually function better in the presence of certain micronutrients so they work as a better uh, block of this virus and you get a better antiviral titer because of these vaccines having these nutrients and what's important about that to remember is we know for a fact that there is quite a bit of micronutrient deficiency in epidemic proportion around the world. So in the case of selenium, we know that trace micro selenium is very low in large populations. We know that zinc is very low. We know that magnesium is very low. All of those, in case of say throwing in the vitamins, also we find out that this would be something to consider just because we know for a fact from experience that when we make a vaccine, these micronutrients make it work better. In this case, where we're dealing with an organism that doesn't really have a vaccine yet available, making certain that everyone has a relatively decent supply of these micronutrients is a very prudent thing to not only help with individual, but also herd innate immunity. When you start looking at general terms of what methylation is all about. We have to realize that methylation is taking into consideration a whole bunch about the vitamins that we take for granted. And it also takes a look at something like magnesium, which we know is one of the nutrients that uh, subclinical uh, deficiencies are quite frankly listed as being epidemic. And they're important because they help to keep in check the calcium racing into the cell through that n methyl aspartate receptor. In addition, N-acetylcysteine is something that's very well tolerated and works exceedingly well at helping to support that glutathione pathway. What turns out to be exceptionally interesting is we realize that some other deficiencies will play a part in our ability to methylate. It turns out that vitamin D is involved in 223 genes at current that we're aware of. Of those 223 genes, a great deal of them, a significant part, are also associated with the ability to do methylation. So inadequate vitamin D automatically sets you up as being more probably than not to have problems with methylation. So to begin with, understanding that vitamin D ranges vary by scale, but there's a significant group of literature that indicates that the scaling that you look at where you see 0 through 20 is deficient, 20 through 30 is insufficient, and then you're faced with this range of 30 to 100 is normal. In reality, in the case when you take into consider methylation, you begin to realize why having a vitamin D range from 65 to say 85 is a much better example of where you would ideally want to be, especially if you're going to be dealing with viruses, especially if you know for a fact you have an old series of viral infections out there, because you don't want to allow for methylation to be in a state where it's not adequate and you have hypomethylation because of inadequate vitamin D, now you have the chance to allow for these low-level replication processes of the viruses out there to continue to work unchecked. The example that I give you here is a pretty good one because it talks about the Epstein-Barr virus and I'll go over what the CDC has recently published as recently as last year in February and the implications of the Epstein-Barr virus, but let's just take a look at the human papillomas virus for a second, what we do know. Unchecked replication of this virus in the background is associated with cancer of any place where this virus has taken seed. So if it's one that's a case of uh, in the uh, throat, in the case of the vagina, or in the case of the rectum, any of those areas can be associated with cancers developing because of unchecked viral replication. So while it may be that we have a vaccine out for HPV, we also have to realize that there are multiple strains for which we don't apparently have a vaccine yet available. So the case being, it's important to realize that uh, one of the clinically things that we would want to do is not have ourselves in a state of low methylation. 
we would not want to have a state of a low vitamin D state because that so much increases the activity of these viruses. In the case of the Epstein-Barr virus, it becomes very important because we know for a fact that when that Epstein-Barr virus is allowed to run unchecked with a low level of replication occurring because of that methylation problem, which may be in part due to a low vitamin D problem, you now have yourself set up for all of these different problems. In fact, it's impossible to have multiple sclerosis with not having had Epstein-Barr virus. We know that the facts that nucleic factor kappa B play a huge part in a lot of things. We also understand that phytonutrients, the 25,000 we've identified so far, sometimes are involved in the upregulation or downregulation of our ability to block NF kappa B. So again, vitamin D to start with, it plays a part in blocking and inhibiting NF kappa B. So having low vitamin D levels automatically makes you more likely to have problems with nucleic factor kappa B, which is the principal driver for a lot of inflammation problems inside the body. These combination of different things can be found in several nutritional products. One of them was developed by, I believe, by Dr. Vasquez called Kappa Rest. Uh, and that product works to help dampen this by having frankincense, which is boswalla. Uh, some CoQ10, cumin, um, grapeseed extract, green tea extract, several parts of these are in there. Things that we would take as a supplement may also be additional in acetylcysteine. Being aware that uh, the EPA of the omega-3 oils, EPA DHA, is basically a proximal peripheral activator receptor block of the alpha type. So these fatty acid receptors where I talked about lining the cell of the peroxisomes which is importantly listening to communication from the endoplasmic reticulum, looking at things inside the nucleus, and also getting feedback from the mitochondria. These receptors again play a big part in downregulating inflammation. Selenium, rosemary, several of these different compounds can be found as nutritional support that are going to be a benefit to keeping nucleic factor kappa B in check. When you look at his model where he originally laid out for us how these inflammatory stressors have an effect on nucleic factor kappa B. Their impact on health problems that we know about. We realize that the driving process of these entire chemicals and how these in their own right are going to upregulate and this becomes a cyclic problem. It literally just reinforces itself. When you add in the th uh, thinking about viruses and realize the low level replication going on due to some of these processes are going to drive problems to the mitochondria, cause the endoplasmic particular stress problems, and even hijack some of the DNA problems for the replication of these viruses. And then you have to deal with the endogenous viruses also being allowed to run in the background. All of this basically lays out uh, in several texts that he has written uh, that we'll find beneficial. When you start looking at what his description has been about the amino nutritional side, it has to do with we know that having a high carb diet with lots of sugar tends to make a lot more problems and be, in, be non beneficial. Whereas you have more of a low carb diet with good nutrients, adequate vitamin D, and adequate vitamin A. And this is sort of important in ways that we really didn't appreciate because it's been listed in some studies that certain uh, European groups of women tend to have the inability to take beta carotene and transform it into vitamin A. So this is believed to be why we have a increased susceptibility to autoimmune diseases in women that have the inability to make vitamin D out of beta carotene. And that's important because without adequate vitamin D and vitamin A as well as some other nutrients, this leads to the upregulation of that TH3, or is now known as TH17, which is associated with a lot of autoimmune diseases. Appreciate when we start talking Epstein-Barr virus, the penetration rate is between 90 and 95 percent of adults in this country have been exposed and have had Epstein-Barr virus. In and of itself, that's a big deal because, as the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, has pointed out, the Epstein-Barr virus has been associated and identified as a culprit underlying with a lot of different processes that we really didn't understand. 
and it also comes out that these Epstein varvirus are linked in some different types of things that we didn't really have a good appreciation of, such as even the idea of pancreatitis. And to find out that Epstein Barr virus is associated with several known cancers is also significant. So again, this would be where it would be important that you had adequate vitamin D. This is where you'd be important that you know that you have enough methylation going on so you don't have elevated homocysteine levels. And these are things that would be important not just to the COVID-19 virus, but any virus in general, because this is an example of these viruses, this monovirus, specifically the type called the Epstein-Barr virus, mind you, running in the background, has been proven to be evolved with all these different types of pathologies. Unchecked in the background, viruses running are turning out to be what's causing many different health problems we didn't realize. And the fact that all of these particular maladies have now had, in part, been associated with this Epstein-Barr virus drives home the part that we begin to understand that these viruses are significant. So what we want to do is understand that also chemical pollution sometimes can be a part or, or playing in making the effects of homocysteine levels being high or replicating hypomethylation and the fact that some of these chemicals and forms of pollutants that we get in our environment appear to be part of the reason why we're having some cancers and this is the mechanism that explains how some cancers develop due to these chemicals having effect of being a demethylator or acting to induce a state of hypomethylation. Some medications are showing to actually have a hypomethylation factor to them in the case of being able to induce the autoimmune disease of a drug-induced type of a type of lupus. And then understanding in the sense of cellular support, optimal sleep, not being stressed, not getting too much sugar, these are going to be supporting your mitochondria and the endoplasmic particulum, as well as the nucleus, as well as that calcium receptor called the n aspartate receptor. All of this is going to be a big factor in how healthy you are in general. Today we realize that we have eight different herpes type of viruses out there that are associated with humans. Specifically, most of us have been made familiar with have heard of cold sores if we don't have one already ourselves. They're fairly common, been around for a long time. Uh, the herpes 2, uh, or genital herpes, is something that became more prevalent in the scenes in the last 35 years. The herpes 3 virus is our chickenpox virus, the varicella virus. It's what you think about with cases of herpes zoster or shingles. Now understanding the process of methylation being a factor, the process of low vitamin D being a factor, to help yourself if you've had the chicken pox and if you've been exposed to it, one of the things you want to be aware of, being in a state of hypomethylation, being in a state of low vitamin D, you're up regulating the chances of having an outbreak of shingles. Now that you understand this, you realize this is something you want to avoid. Being aware that the monovirus or the Epstein-Barr virus type we're going to talk about and we've seen is involved in lots of different problems and can cause many other diseases if it's allowed to run unchecked. So having hypomethylation again, having low vitamin D is setting yourself up to all these other maladies that we know about. The herpes simplex type 5 is also called mononucleosis uh, or by understanding that this is not the same virus. The cytomelia virus and the Epstein-Barr virus are two different viruses. Both of them are herpes viruses. What's important about the distinction is the Epstein-Barr virus is associated with one group of problems. The cytomelia virus running unchecked in the background is associated with a different group of problems. In the case of herpes 1 has been associated running in the background with being associated with the uptick of not only being the trigeminal nerve, but allowing and gaining access and being a driver in certain types of Alzheimer's. So again, this, this idea of having viruses run unchecked at a low level on a chronic continual inflammation process have many health consequences that we truly didn't begin to get a grasp of until recently. 
So being aware that vitamin D is important, being aware that uh, having a good methylation process helps to keep viruses in check as well as cancers. In the case of herpes 6 and 7, both of these are have penetration rates in the environment of 90 some odd percent, 6, 7 percent of uh, being infected and most kids have had these viruses while being in pre-K or early on in their exposure into groups. So this is not a rare virus, but it's important to understand that in case of, say like, multiple sclerosis, it has been identified that you have to have had herpes uh, simplex type 6, you've also had to have the Epstein-Barr virus, and in addition to that, in some cases it appears that maybe an infection with a pinworm reoccurring infection may be the driving factor that's associated with emerging multiple sclerosis as well as the continual relapsing nature of it. When you look at herpes 8, this is a fairly rare virus unless it's associated with the HIV patient, but there have been some reported cases of people developing the coughlick sarcoma as a result of this that don't have HIV. The importance to remember in this is there are things out there about viruses we do know. The other thing is more common viruses that we think about all of these go into that exogenous viral population that we have that make us up individually because we've been exposed to them or had them. And the point being is that increases the likelihood of us having other problems, especially if these viruses are left unchecked. In the case of the cytomegalia virus, this particular double-strand DNA virus has been associated to be in the driver's component of systemic lupus erythematosus, as well as some of these other virusal suction. Uh, scleroderma has been associated with cytomegalovirus. And then Epstein-Barr virus, in addition to what we talked about that was released from the CDC in February 2019, we know that it's also involved in scleroderma, Sojourn's uh, syndrome, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, and again, once we said, multiple sclerosis. This concludes our presentation on viral and mitochondrial connection. So what we can take away from this is that we now know that nutrition, such as vitamin D levels, methylation as it relates to B vitamins, certain other nutrients like phytonutrients in the case of sulforaphane, also has an impact on methylation. It also has an effect on homocysteine. All of these taken into context, this is beginning to lay the foundation of why nutrition and specifically phytonutrition in addition, as well as some of the more common vitamins, we now understand the mechanisms and physiology, how normal good levels of this defend against such things as cancers even, and how environmental pollution sometimes has a directing effect on methylation changes. I want to thank all the authors for their information provided, as well as the illustrations that have been borrowed from Dr. Alex Vasquez. This video is not for sale and can be used in its entirety by any of those that wish to. I would also recommend those individuals that want to have a better in-depth knowledge to avail themselves to the text that have been written by Dr. Alex Vasquez. His paramount position in explaining a lot of the different mechanisms in this is the forerunner to this information and explanation. CDC, for their contributions, contributions and information regarding the Epstein-Barr virus that came out February 2019, as well as the information describing how bacteria cross-reactivity with the mitochondria being a toll-like receptor number nine event and explaining the consequences of that as well as the other organisms out there that have DNA which will allow for that toll-like receptor crossover reaction. I would like you to avail yourself to other videos that we have produced. This particular video is for non-commercial production and your use of it in its entirety is authorized.
On August 11th and 12th of 2016, a stalled no-name storm dumped 31 inches of rain in southeastern Louisiana in 24 hours. Four trillion gallons of water caused unprecedented levels of flooding in five parishes. And the estimated destruction of 40,000 homes and as many businesses. The members of United Associated Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 198 decided the right thing to do was mobilize a workforce to help its members, their families, neighbors, and others recover from the damages caused by the flood. Union members from surrounding communities. Prayer helps a lot. Prayer helps a whole lot. If it wasn't for having faith in the Lord, you wouldn't have faith enough to be doing this. And good Lord willing, things will get back like they used to be. In 2016, we one day woke up and had to realize that we are all the same. And by the grace of God, we are all going to be okay. Let's not forget what happened here. Not with the devastation, but with the compassion, the support, and the caring and love that was given to this community in their time of need. Louisiana is no stranger to adversity. People are helping one another heal. And the story of survival and success in the face of this flood will simply become a part of the proud history of a resilient culture. United Associated Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 198 appreciates on behalf of its members every person and organization that donated in some way to this effort. It's gonna be alright Alright It's gonna be alright Alright my sister It's gonna be alright No matter how far down you are My brother you can be lifted up With the flicker of a switch your whole world can be relit up all right it's gonna be all right all right my brother it's gonna be all right all right it's gonna be